Section Zero of the Lieutenant and Others. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lieutenant and Others by Sapper. Preface. It is perhaps unnecessary to state that none of the sketches in this book refer to any particular individual. They are not arranged in chronological order. They do not pretend to be anything more than mere impressions of the grim drama now being played across the water. Some of those pictured in these pages have gone across the veil of shadows. May the earth lie lightly on them, one and all. Others there are who, perchance, may think they recognize themselves here and there. To them I dedicate the book. The setting in most of the sketches is the salient of Ypres. There may be some who will recognize, not, I trust, without a throb of pleasure, Hooge, Fresenberg, the Menengate, and other health resorts of that delectable neighborhood. But should I lift in the smallest degree, for those who wait behind, the curtain that shrouds somewhere in France, and show them the tears and the laughter, the humor and the pathos that go to form the atmosphere over yonder. I shall be well satisfied. I am no artist in words, but each in his separate star shall paint the thing as he sees it for the God of things as they are. End of section zero. Section one of The Lieutenant and Others. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa. The Lieutenant and Others by Sapper. The Lieutenant, Chapters 1 and 2. The Lieutenant, A Fortnight in France, May 10th to May 24th, 1915. Chapter 1. Gerald Ainsworth was the only son of his parents, and they made something in tins. He had lots of money, as the sons of people who dabble in tins frequently do. He was a prominent member of several dull nightclubs, where he was in the habit of seeing life while other people saw his money. He did nothing and was generally rather bored with the process. In fact, he was a typical product of the 20th century, with his father's house in the country full of footmen and ancestors, both types guaranteed by the best references and his own rooms in London full of clothes and photographs. He was a very fair sample of that dread disease, the nut, and it was not altogether his own fault. Given an income that enabled him to do what he liked, certain that he would never be called on to work for his living, he had degenerated into a drifter through the pleasant paths of life a man who had never done one single thing of the very slightest use to himself or anybody else. Then came the war, and our hero, who was not by any means a bad fellow at heart, obtained a commission. It was a bit of an event in the family of Ainsworth, nay Blobs, and the soldier ancestor of Charles I's reign smiled approval from the walls of the family dining room. As I have said, it was guaranteed to behave as all well-brought-up ancestors are reputed to do. Gerald was becomingly modest about it all, and to do him credit, did not suffer from uniformitis as badly as some I wot of. 
It is possible that a small episode which occurred in the drawing room of the baronial hall had something to do with it. For, I will repeat, he was not a bad fellow at heart. And this was the episode. Coming in one Saturday afternoon on weekend leave in the full glory of his new uniform, he found the room full of girls. His income would in time be over five figures, his return for the weekend had not been kept secret, and there may or may not be a connection. Also there were his mother and father and one very bored man of about thirty in plain clothes. This is my son, Gerald, cooed the old lady. So splendid of him, you know, joining the army. This dreadful war, you know. More tea, my dear? Poor things out there, how I pity them. Quite terrible. But don't you think it's splendid, the way they're all joining? The bored man in Mufti looked more bored. Why? he asked resignedly. Why? echoed a creation on his right indignantly. How can you ask such a thing? Think of all the hardship and suffering they'll have to endure. Isn't that enough? And she glanced tenderly at Gerald, while six other creations bit savagely at Muffins because she'd got it out first. I don't quite follow the argument, answered the bored man patiently. If a man has no ties, I don't see that there is any credit in his joining the army. It is his plain duty, and the gravest discredit attaches to him if he doesn't. Don't you agree with me? And he turned to Gerald. Certainly, answered Gerald, with the faintest hesitation. The line of argument was a little new. And what regiment are you going to join? remarked another creation, with dangerous sweetness. The bored man smiled slightly. The one I've been in for ten years. I've just come back from Central Africa and crossed the day after tomorrow. As I have said, it is possible that this small incident tended to make the disease of uniformitis a mild one in our hero's case, and to bring home to him exactly what the Pucka soldier does think of it all. Time went on as time will do, and over his doings in the winter I will not linger. Bar the fact that he'd been worked till he was just about as fit as a man can be, I really know nothing about them. My story is of his coming to France and what happened to him while he was there till, stopping one in the shoulder, he went back to England feet first, a man where before he had been an ass. He was only in France a fortnight from the time he landed at Havre till the time they put him on a hospital ship at Boulogne, but in that fortnight he lived, and, not to put too fine a point on it, Deuce had nearly died as well so he got his money's worth. And now, for I have lingered too much on the introduction of my hero, I will get to business. The train crept on through the night, now pulling up with a series of nerve-shattering jolts, then on again at its apparently maximum speed of twenty miles an hour. In the corner of a so-called first-class carriage, Gerald Ainsworth stared into the darkness with unseeing eyes. The dim shapes that flashed past him seemed like the phantasmagoria of a dream. For the first time for three days he had the time to think. He recalled the lunch in Southampton when he had said goodbye to various people who seemed to have a slight difficulty in speaking. He remembered dining in the hotel whose sacred portals are barred to the civilian, still in ignorance of where he was going to France, the Dardanelles, or even farther afield. Then all the bustle of embarking the regiment, and later disembarking. And now he was actually underway, starting on the great adventure. There were others in the carriage with him, but only one was asleep, and he did not belong to the regiment. To him the adventure had ceased to be great. It was old and stale and he had spent most of his time cursing at not being able to raise a motor car. For when you know the ropes, be it whispered, 
it is generally your own fault if you travel by supply train. But of that the man who sat staring out of the window knew nothing. All he knew was that every minute carried him nearer the unknown, the unknown of which he had read so much and knew so little. His equipment was very new and beautiful, and very bulky. Prominent among it was that abomination of desolation, the fitted mess tin. Inside it reposed little receptacles for salt and pepper and plates and dinner napkins and spirit lamps that explode like bombs. Aunts are aunts, and there was none to tell him that the roads of Flanders are paved with fitted mess tins. His revolver was loaded. In fact, five of those dangerous weapons reposed in the racks. The gentleman who slept was armed only with a walking stick. Gerald Ainsworth muttered impatiently under his breath as the train stopped for the twelfth time in an hour. Putrid journey, isn't it? said the man opposite him, and he grunted in acquiescence. Somehow he did not feel very much like talking. He recalled that little episode in the drawing-room of months ago. He recalled the man in Mufti's cool, quiet face, his calm assumption that there was no credit in coming to fight, but merely disgrace if you did not. He realized that he and his like were on trial, and that the judge and jury were those same quiet-faced men who for centuries, from father to son, have carried the name of England into the four corners of the world, without hope of reward, just because it was their job. Those men who for years have realized that the old country was slipping, sliding down from the place that is hers by right of blood. Those men who were hanging on, waiting for him and his like to come and do their bit. He realized that the trial for which he had trained so hard was approaching, that every minute carried him nearer the final test from which he might or might not come alive. And how many of those others, his judges, lay quiet and still in unmarked graves? In the dim light he looked critically at his hand. It was perfectly steady. Shamefacedly unseen he felt his pulse. It was normal. He was not afraid, that he knew. And yet somehow in the pit of his stomach there was a curious sort of feeling. He recalled the first time he had batted at school before a large crowd. He recalled the time when, lying on an operating table, he had seen the doctor fiddling with his instruments. He recalled those horrible ancient newspapers in the waiting room at his dentist's. And grimly he realized that the feeling was much the same. It was fear of the unknown, he told himself savagely. Moreover, he was right. Yet he envied fiercely, furiously, the man sleeping in the opposite corner who came to war with a walking stick. But the man who came to war with a walking stick, who slept so easily in his corner, who swore because he could not get a motor car, had had just that same sinking sensation one night eight or nine months ago. He recalled the girls whose photographs adorned his rooms in London. He recalled the nightclubs where women of a type always kind to him had been even kinder since he had put on a uniform. He recalled the home his father had bought. The home of a family finished and done with, wiped out in the market of money, wiped out by something in tins. And somehow the hollowness of the whole thing struck him for the first time. He saw himself for what he really was, the progeny of an uneducated man with a business instinct, and yet the welcome guest of people who would have ignored him utterly had the tins proved bad. And suddenly he found himself face to face with the realities of life, because in that slow-going, bumping train his imagination had shown him the realities of death. So far, the only shells he had ever heard had been fired at a practice camp in England. So far, he had never seen a man who had died a violent death. But that train, crawling through the still summer night, 
and his imagination supplied the deficiencies. He was face to face with realities, and the chains of England seemed a bit misty. And yet a week ago they had seemed so real. Can Bernardi have been right, after all, in some of the things he said? Is war necessary for a nation? Does it show up life in its true colors, when money ceases to be the only criterion? Bernardi may have been right, but anyway he is a horrible fellow. When Gerald Ainsworth woke up, the train had grunted to a final halt at a biggish station, and the early morning sun was shining in a cloudless sky. Chapter 2 Ainsworth fell out of the train, endeavouring to buckle the various straps that held together his Christmas tree of equipment. In the intervals of getting his platoon sorted out, he looked about him with a vague sort of feeling of surprise. Somehow he'd expected things would look different. And behold, everything was just normal. A French sentry with his long-pointed bayonet at the crossing just outside the station seemed the only thing alive besides himself and his men. The man opposite, who had slept so soundly, had disappeared, swearing volubly, to lie in wait for a motor car. And then happening to look at the colonel, he found him in earnest consultation with an officer, who sported a red band on his arm. This extremely crusty individual he subsequently discovered boasted the mystic letters RTO on his band, which for the benefit of the uninitiated may be translated Railway Transport Officer, and though as a rule their duties do not carry them within range of the festive obus, or shell, yet their crustiness, the few who are crusty, may be forgiven them. For to them come wandering at all hours of the twenty-four men of all sorts, sizes, and descriptions, bleeding for information and help. The type of individual who has lost his warrant, his equipment, and his head, and doesn't know where he is bound for, but it is somewhere beginning with a B, is particularly popular with them early in the morning. However, that is all by the way. They filed out of the station, and the battalion sat down beside the road while the cooks got busy over breakfast. Periodically a staff officer hacked by on a rustic morning liver shaker, and a couple of aeroplanes, flying low, passed over their heads bound on an early reconnaissance. They were still many miles from the firing line, and save for a low but insistent muttering, coming sullenly through the still morning air, they might have been in England. In fact, it was a great deal more peaceful than training in England. The inhabitants passing by scarcely turned their heads to look at them, and, save for the inevitable crowd of small children who alternately sucked their dirty thumbs and demanded, Cigarette? Souvenir? No one seemed at all interested in their existence. Everything was very different from the tin god atmosphere of England. At last a whistle blew, and there was a general tightening of belts and straps. The battalion fell in, and with its head to the east swung off along the dusty road towards the distant muttering guns. As a route march it was much like other route marches, except that they were actually in Flanders. The country was flat and uninteresting. The roads were pavé and very unpleasant to march on. Ainsworth's pack felt confoundedly heavy, and the top had come off the pepper receptacle in the fitted mess tin. They passed some Indians squatting in a field by the roadside, and occasionally a party of cavalry horses out on exercise, for the cavalry were up in the trenches, and when they're up there, they leave the horses behind. Also, gilded beings in motor cars went past periodically, to the accompaniment of curses and much dust. The battalion was singing as it swung along, and in front, a band of a sort gave forth martial music. 
the principal result of which was to bring those auditors not connected with the regiment cursing from their bivouacs at the unseemly noise. And then miles away in the distance they saw a line of little white puffs up in the blue of the sky, a new one appearing every second. It was Archibald, or the anti-aircraft gun, doing the dirty, that fruitful source of stiff necks to those who see him for the first time. But I will not dwell on that route march. It was, as I have said, much like others, only more so. That evening a very hot, tired, and dusty battalion came to rest in some wooden huts beside the road, their home for the next two or three days. The guns were much louder now, though everything else was still very quiet. Away about four or five miles in front of them, a great pall of smoke hung lazily in the air, marking the funeral pyre of ill-fated wipers, for that was their destination in the near future, as Ainsworth had already found out from the adjutant. Opposite them, on the other side of the road, a cavalry regiment just out of the trenches was resting. Everything seemed perfectly normal. No one seemed to feel the slightest excitement at being within half a dozen miles of the firing line. The officers over the way were ragging, much as they did at home. After a cursory glance at his battalion, to size it up, none of them had paid the slightest attention to them. The arrival of some new men was too common a sight for anyone to get excited about. But Ainsworth could not be expected to know that. He had strolled out just before dinner, and as he reached a bend in the road, the evening frightfulness in Ypres started. For ten minutes or a quarter of an hour, a furious shelling went on, gradually dying away to comparative quiet again. Is anything happening? he asked of a passing cavalry subaltern. Not that I know of, returned the other in some surprise. But they're shelling very hard, aren't they? That? That's nothing. They do that most nights. Are you just out? Where are you going? Wipers, I think. What's it like? Damnable, rejoined the other tersely, and with that the conversation languished. For all that, when Gerald pulled the blankets up to his chin that night, the feeling in the pit of his stomach had gone. He felt that he'd started to bat, that he was actually in the dentist's chair. Three days of complete quiet passed, three days that seemed to give the lie to his laconic cavalry acquaintance. Occasionally a burst of shelling proclaimed that neither side was actually asleep, and at night, towards the south, the green German flares could be seen like brilliant stars in the sky. In the main, however, peace was the order of the day. Those who knew were not deceived, however, for there were many lulls before the storm in the Second Battle of Ypres, that long-drawn-out struggle round the salient. But to the battalion, just arrived, the whole thing seemed rather disappointing. They were tired of archies and aeroplanes. They were tired of the red glow they could see through the trees at night, where Ypres lay burning. Above all, they were tired of getting smothered with dust from passing motor lorries and ambulances which crashed up and down the road at all hours of the day and night. Like everyone when they first arrived, they wanted to be up and at it. The men had all been issued with respirators, and nightly did breathing exercises, in through the mouth and out through the nose, to the accompaniment of facetious remarks from the onlookers. They had not dabbled in Hun gas as yet, nor appreciated its delights, so the parade was not a popular one. Comments on Im with the Iron Mask, and requests of a personal nature to your friends always to wear a pad owing to their improved appearance, enlivened what otherwise would have been a somewhat boring performance. A week later, but I will not anticipate. Ainsworth himself, to pass the time, had tried a little bomb-throwing with his platoon. 
This also had not been an unqualified success. As far as the jam tins and hand grenades were concerned, everything in the garden was lovely. Quite a number went off, and all would have been well had not the tempter tempted. Reposing on the ground, brought up by an imbecile sergeant, lay a rifle grenade, that infernal invention which, on leaving the rifle, puts a boomerang to shame and generally winds up in the commanding officer's dugout, there exploding with great force. However, as I have remarked before, Ainsworth could not be expected to know that. Knowledge on the avoidance of supply trains, and boredom, and the devilry that lies latent in a rifle grenade, comes only with many weary weeks. So he fired it. Away it went, soaring into space, and at length a great explosion announced that all was over. It seemed to go some way, sir, said the sergeant. It did, answered Ainsworth. Farther than I thought. His face expressed a little uneasiness, when suddenly an apparition appeared. Hopping over a ploughed field towards him, brandishing his arms, came an infuriated figure in carpet slippers. The platoon paused in silent dismay, while a bull-like bellow came floating through the air. "'You blithering ass!' roared an excited voice, as a purple-faced gunner major came to a standstill in front of him. "'You fat-headed, splay-footed idiot! I have been shelled and gassed and shot at for two months without a pause by the Germans, and when I come back here to rest, you plaster my picket line with lumps of steel and burst lidite bombs on my bed!' I'm very sorry, sir, said Ainsworth. I had no idea. Then, damn it, go away and get one. Go away and make noises and explosions in your own bed, or apply to go to the Dardanelles or something. You're a menace, sir, a pest, and you ought to be locked up. So that, all things being considered, it came as a distinct relief to our somewhat roughed and misunderstood hero when, on returning to lunch, he found the battalion was going up into the reserve trenches that night. End of section one. Recording by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa. Section two of The Lieutenant and Others. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa. The Lieutenant and Others by Sapper. The Lieutenant, Chapters 3 and 4. Chapter 3. And so it came to pass that at six o'clock that evening, Gerald Ainsworth, with a few other officers of his battalion, jogged slowly along in a bone-shaking wagon toward Ypres. He was going up early to take over the trenches from the battalion they were relieving, which in turn was going up to the front line. Past the station with its twisted rails and splintered sleepers, past the water tower, almost untouched at that time amid the general devastation, on down the road, and then right-handed into the square. Some blackened half-burned carcasses lying under the ruins of the cloth hall the first actual trace of war he had seen, held him fascinated. Down a side street a house was burning fiercely, but of life there was none, except one military policeman watching for looters. A very young subaltern on the box seat was being entertained by the ASC driver, one of the good old sort. Six officers fresh from home, thirsting for blood, should they not have it? Every shell hole held a story, and the driver was an artist. You can take it from me, sir, and I knows. This year place weren't no blooming picnic three weeks ago. The major, he says to me, Jones, he says, the ration limbers have gone off and have forgotten the tea. 
I looks to you to get the tea to them lads in the trenches. Also, there's an allowance of pepper been sent out in a parcel by the League of Beauty in Tooting for our gallant defenders in France. Put that in too. Very good, sir, I says. They shall have their tea and their pepper, or my name's not Alf Jones. With that, sir, I harnesses up the old horses and I gallops. Through here I comes, the old horses going like two-year-olds. And then they was shelling it, no blooming error. As I was going through, the cathedral fell down and one of the tiles hit me on the napper. But what did I care? Just as I gets here, I meets a party of officers. Three generals and their staff blokes. Says they to me, they says, Stop, for the generals are gassed and you must take us away. I says to him, I says, And what about the pepper gentlemen for the men in the trenches? Pepper, cries a staff officer. And as he spoke, we took it, sir. Right into the back of the wagon they put a 17-inch shell, and the gift from the League of Beauty was all over the square. Sneeze! You should have heard us. The commander-in-chief, he sneezed the gas right out of him, and the Lindsay Lancer, he says to me, he says, Jones, you've saved our lives. Yes, I says, you're welcome to any little thing like that. But what about them poor trusting girls and their pepper? It was at this moment, I subsequently gathered, that my subaltern hove in sight carrying two large mirrors under his arm and, finding where they were going, demanded a lift. Very quiet tonight, he remarked when he was stowed inside. I've just been looting mirrors for periscopes. Now I've brought him into the story because he was the first man to tell them that the reserve trenches they were occupying were not all honey and strawberry jam. He's a useless young blighter, and unless he's watched very carefully he always drinks more than his fair share of port. But in view of the fact that other people will arrive in time and go and sit, if not in those particular trenches, at any rate in trenches like them, I would like to point out that the man on the spot knows what he's talking about. Also that, because for three days on end you do a thing with perfect safety, it does not follow that you won't be killed doing it the fourth. And I would like it to be clearly established that my port-drinking looter of mirrors told the officers in the wagon that the line they were going into was habitually shelled. Remember, everything was quiet. Those who may happen to read these words and who know Ypres will bear me witness as to how quiet it can be, and will agree with me that it can frequently be otherwise. Now they dropped him halfway at a place where there are cellars in which a man may live in safety, and there they disembarked from the wagon and walked, and all was peace. One dead horse, a very dead horse, raised its voice to heaven in mute protest, but otherwise all was perfectly peaceful. Two or three shells passed overhead as they walked down the road, but these were quite obviously harmless. And suddenly one of our own batteries let drive from close by with a deafening bang. Nothing untoward occurred, and yet they were quite near enough to hear individual rifle shots. And so they came to the trenches which they were to occupy, and found them full of a regiment which had been in them for two days and was going up to the front line that night. The right flank rested on a railway line, and the left on no special mark in particular. Away in front of them on the left, a dull brownish smudge could be seen on the ground in a place where the country was open. The German trenches. Who does not remember the feelings with which he first contemplated the German front trench and realized that there actually reposed the Huns? And, in passing, it's a strange fact 
but nevertheless a true one, that quite a number of men have been out to the trenches, survived two or three days, been wounded, and gone home without so much as seeing a Bosch. That night the battalion made their first acquaintance with trenches as a bed. Luckily they were dry as trenches go, though they suffered, in common with all other trenches, from an eruption of small pools of water occurring exactly where you wanted to put your head. And now the time has come for me to justify my subaltern's existence and entry into this story. As I said before, he had warned that party of officers that the trench was not healthy at all times, but his voice was as the voice of the Tishbite, or Job, or whoever it was who cried in vain. For the next morning, a beautiful warm morning, the men woke up a bit cramped and stiff, and getting up to stretch themselves found that everything was still quiet and peaceful. And one by one they got out of the trenches and strolled about discussing life in general and breakfast in particular. Also several of the officers did the same. It came without warning, like a bolt from the blue. A screaming sort of whiz, and then bang, 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 all along the line, for the range was known by the Germans to twenty yards. The officer Gerald was talking to gave a funny little throaty cough and collapsed like a pricked bladder. And he lay very still with his eyes staring, a sentence cut short on his lips with a crimson stream spreading slowly from his head. For a moment, Gerald stood dazed, and then with a gasp fell into the trench, pulling the officer after him. Crump! Crump! came two high explosive shells, plump on the parapet, burying about ten men in the debris, and for a space the battalion ceased to discuss things in general and breakfast in particular. Four hours later they were still sitting remarkably tight in the trenches. Airings on the ground had ceased to be popular, for behind the trench lay a dozen still forms with covered faces. Suddenly there came a voice from above Gerald, inquiring, to the accompaniment of much unparliamentary language, who was in charge of that bit of trench. Looking up, he encountered the fierce gaze of a staff officer and with him a crusty-looking sapper captain. "'I say, look out!' he cried, getting up. "'It's awful up there. "'We lost about thirty men this morning.' "'So I see,' answered the staff officer. "'What the deuce were they doing up here? "'Are you aware that this is under direct observation from the Germans?' Some of you fellows seem to think that because things are quiet for five minutes, you can dance pastoral dances in front of your trenches. He grunted dispassionately. The sapper captain took up the ball. What do you propose to do where the parapet has collapsed? He inquired. I really hadn't thought about it, answered Ainsworth looking at the collapsed trench. I haven't had any orders. Orders! On matters of that sort, you don't receive them, you give them. On the road are hundreds of sandbags, thousands of sandbags, millions of... The staff officer caught his eye. Daily they quarreled over sandbags. At any rate, he went on firmly, there are lots of sandbags. Go and get them. Fill them. Build up the bally trench, and don't leave it like that for the next poor blighters. Work on trenches is never finished. You can go on for days and weeks and months, but the staff officer was leading him away. Years, I tell you, can you work on these damn trenches? And he waits for orders. Peter, you're feverish. The staff officer gently drew him on, and they suddenly paused. What? he cried, in a voice of concentrated fury, 
gazing at a trench full of faces upturned to the sky. What are you looking at? Turn your faces down, you fat-headed dolts. I know it's a German aeroplane. I saw it three minutes ago. And there you sit with a row of white faces gazing up at him, so as to leave him in no doubt that the trenches are occupied. Keep down and don't move, and above all don't show him a great line of white blotches. They're bad enough for us to bear as it is, but, James, you're feverish now. It was the sapper officer's turn to draw him away. But I admit, he remarked sadly as they faded away, that it's all quite dreadful. They learn in time, but, to begin with, they want nurses. And, lest the morning perambulation of these two weary officers may seem inconsistent in any way with their words, I would point out that what two or three may do in perfect safety, a body of men may not. They don't, as a rule, waste shells on an isolated man in khaki, and these particular trenches were out of rifle range. For the time, therefore, we will leave Gerald building up his trench with those twelve silent bodies behind, eloquent testimony that appearances are deceitful and that the man on the spot knows best. Chapter 4 Is that the guide? What? You're the general's cook! Well, where the devil is the guide? All right, lead on. The battalion was moving up into the front-line trenches after two uneventful days in reserve. Their lesson well learnt, they had kept under cover, and the only diversion had been the sudden appearance out of heaven of an enormous piece of steel which had descended from the skies with great rapidity and an unpleasant zogging sort of noise. The mystery was unearthed from the parapet where it had embedded itself, and completely defeated everyone, till a stray gunner, passing, told them that it was merely part of a German archie shell, which had burst up at a great height and literally fallen like manna from the heavens. Slow in front! For heaven's sake! Agitated mutterings from the rear came bursting up to the front of the column, mingled with crashes and stifled oaths as men fell into shell holes they couldn't see, probably half full of water. Keep still! Duck! An insistent order muttered from every officer as a great green flare shot up into the night and, falling on the ground near them, burnt fiercely and then went out, leaving everything blacker than ever. On their left, a working party furiously deepened a communication trench that already resembled a young river. Coming on their right, as they crept and stumbled along in single file, a small party of men loomed out of the night. More agitated mutterings. Who are you? And from a medley of answers, comprising everyone from the Archbishop of Canterbury to the Kaiser, the fact emerges that they are the ration party of the regiment on their right. At last a halt. The head of the battalion has reached the trenches and the men begin getting in. Not used to the game, there is a lot of unnecessary delay before the men are settled and the other regiment away. They have left behind two or three officers to introduce the new men to the trenches, explain exactly what places are healthy and what are not, where the ammunition is kept and the bombs and the flares. A sniper with a fixed rifle has the other side of this traverse marked, said one of the officers to Gerald. He's up in a tree somewhere, so don't keep any men on the other side of it. He's killed a lot of ours. Listen to him. And from the other side came a ping thud as the bullet hit the earth. Merely a rifle set on a certain mark during the day, 
and loosed off ten or eleven times every hour during the night, hoping to bag something. They're pretty quiet here at present, he was told, but I don't trust em a yard. They're too quiet. Bavarians. If you want to, there's an officer out in front about fifty yards away with a good helmet on. Thought of going out myself last night, but they were too bally busy with their flares. Still, the helmet's worth getting. Well, so long. I think I've shown you everything. Bye-bye. Oh, while I think of it, they've got a bit of this communication trench, about forty yards down, marked. I'd get it deepened. And with that he went, and Ainsworth was alone, stray rifle shots cracking through the night, flares going up with steady persistency. He tested his telephone to headquarters, it was working. He went along his length of trench, one man watching in each little length, the rest lying down with rifles by their sides. Occasionally the watching man gave them one round to show the Hun he wasn't forgotten, while without intermission the ping thud from the fixed rifle came into the earth of the traverse. It formed a sort of lullaby to Gerald. The awakening was drastic. Just as the dawn was faintly streaking the sky, and the men all awake were gripping their rifles in anticipation of any possible attack, the first shells burst along the line. From then on, for what seemed an eternity and was in reality two hours, the shells poured in without cessation. Shrapnel, high explosive, and sometimes a great sausage-shaped fellow, came twisting and hurtling through the air exploding with a most deafening roar. That was the Minenwerfer, trench howitzer. The fumes from the shells got into their eyes, the parapet collapsed, traverses broke down, men gasping, twisting, buried, and still they came. Men, those who still lived, lay dazed and helpless, Whole sections of the front of the trench were torn away in great craters. In some places men, their reason almost gone, got blindly out of the trench. Their one idea to get away from the ghastly living death. But if death was probable in the trench, it was certain outside. The deadly rain of shrapnel searched them out, and one by one they fell. Some, perhaps, dragged on a space with shattered legs, muttering and moaning till another tearing explosion gave them peace. Keep down! Keep down! Ainsworth tried to shout. His lips, trembling with the fearful nerve-shattering inferno, could hardly frame the words. When they came, it was only a whisper, but had he shouted through a megaphone, none would have heard. The din was too incredible. And still they came. His eyes were fixed stupidly on a man kneeling down behind a traverse, who was muttering foolishly to himself. He saw his lips moving. He cursed him foolishly, childishly, when, with a roar that seemed to split his whole head open, a high explosive shell burst on the traverse itself. The man who had been muttering fell forward, was hurled forward, and his head stuck out of the earth which had fallen on him. Gerald laughed. It was deuced funny. He started to howl with mirth, when suddenly the head rolled towards him. But he could not stop laughing. At last he pulled himself together. So this was what he had read about so often in the papers at home, was it? A furious bombardment of our trenches. Perhaps, though, he reflected, this was not a furious bombardment. Perhaps this was only a slight artillery activity upon our front. 
and then he very nearly started laughing again. It was all so frightfully funny. The actual thing was so utterly different. And so far he had not seen a German. Everything had been so completely peaceful, until that morning, and then, without warning, this. Most amazing of all, he was not touched, and as that realization first took hold of him, so his dulled faculties first grasped the fact that the fire was slackening. It was, and, just like a tropical storm, suddenly it seemed to die away. Shells still passed screaming overhead, but those devastating explosions on the trenches, on his trenches, had ceased. Like the sudden cessation of bad toothache, he could hardly believe it at first. His mind, his brain were still dazed. He seemed to be waking from a nightmare, but only half awake. How long he lay there no one will ever know trying to steady his hand, to still the twitching of his muscles, but suddenly he was recalled to his senses by seeing a figure coming crawling round the shattered traverse. It was his captain. Thank heaven, you've not stopped one, old boy, he said. Good God, you've had it bad here. Gerald nodded. He could not speak. His captain looked at him, and so did the sapper officer who came behind. And, being men of understanding, for a space there was silence. Worst bit of the whole line, said the sapper. We must hold it where we can today and get it patched up tonight. How many men have you got left, Gerald, in your platoon? I don't know, he answered, and his voice sounded strange. He looked to see if the others noticed it, but they made no sign. As a matter of fact, his voice was quavering like an old man's. But, as I have said, they were men of understanding. I'll go and see. And so the three crawled on and in various odd corners they pulled out white-faced men. One in a corner was mad. He was playing a game by himself with another man's boot, a boot that contained its original owner's foot. One man was sobbing quietly, but most of them were just staring dazedly in front of them. Suddenly Gerald clutched his captain's arm. Evan, sir, he croaked. They can get through here. Not by day, answered the sapper. The ground in front is enfiladed from higher up, and, as a matter of fact, they show no signs of advancing. The bombardment has failed. Failed, failed, croaked Ainsworth, and he laughed hideously. Rather, I noticed the failure. Nevertheless, old chap, what I say is right. They've failed because they can't advance. He put his hand on Gerald's arm for a moment. They may try to make a small local advance tonight under cover of dark, but I don't think we'll be troubled till then. They won't renew the bombardment from what I know of them. And with that he was gone. And so Gerald gathered together the remnants of his platoon and there were fifteen all told. He put them where he could and waited for the night, when, with another working party, the trenches could be built up to their proper shape again. And then he went and sat down again and wondered at life. Overhead the shells still screamed on their way. In the distance the dull boom of their explosion still came reverberating through the air. He was getting fairly skilled now in estimating where they would burst, for a desultory shelling of the trenches was still going on, though not in his section of the line. And it was then that I think the ass period emerged from the chrysalis stage and the man appeared, for as he listened to the rushing noise through the air, 
saw the great cloud of blackish-white smoke, and later heard the roar of the explosion somewhere down the line, it was borne in on him that there were other things in the world besides nightclubs, that there were other things besides cocktails and whiskey sours and amusing women, and that a new force was at work, the force of death, which made them all seem very petty. The ancestors seemed a bit petty. The money that came from things in tins seemed a bit petty. He only remembered a head rolling towards him with gaping mouth and staring eyes. It struck him that his might have been the head. End of section two. Recording by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa. Section three of the Lieutenant and Others. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa. The Lieutenant and Others by Sapper. The Lieutenant, Chapters 5 and 6. Chapter 5. Now, in reading over what I have written concerning the commencement of Gerald Ainsworth's pilgrimage in the smiling fields of Flanders, I feel that I too have merited the rebuke so quietly given him in those words. They have failed. He had lost his sense of proportion, about which another and a worthier pen than mine has written in connection with this same game of war, and I too have perhaps given those who may read these pages an unfair impression. That bombardment of which I have told was not an ordinary one, it is true, but at the same time it was not anything very extraordinary. Considered by the men who occupied those trenches, it was the nearest approach to a complete cataclysm of the universe that can be conceived of. Considered by the men who sit behind and move the pawns on the board, it was a furious bombardment of one five-hundredth of what they were responsible for. Moreover, it had failed. But it is not to be wondered at that when, some time later, Gerald was attempting to give his father some impression of what that morning had been like, that worthy old gentleman should have expressed great surprise and indignation that it was not reported in the papers, and stated with some freedom his opinion on the muzzling of the English press. And yet, would it not have been making a mountain out of a molehill, a great battle out of nothing at all? Yes, nothing at all. For in this struggle, what are fifty, a hundred men, provided the enemy does not get what he wants? Much to the relatives of the fifty, but nothing to the result. Hard but true. A somewhat bitter fact. However, all this is a digression. We left Gerald, I think, with the remnants of his platoon scattered along what once were trenches, holding them till under cover of night a fresh working party could come up and rebuild them. The wire in front of him had been destroyed by the shell fire, and nothing but a piece of field, pitted and torn up by explosions, separated him from the Germans fifty yards away. The Germans facing him had established a superiority of rifle fire. Secure in practically undamaged trenches, did a man but show his hat opposite them, it was riddled with bullets. Wherefore, after a couple of the remnants of the platoon had ill-advisedly shown their hats with their heads inside them, and a second later had subsided with a choking grunt and a final kick, the survivors confined their attention to the bottom of the trench, and from it sorted out the bombs and the flares and the reserve ammunition. Also they sorted out other things, which we need not specify, and threw them out behind, where in time perhaps they might be decently buried. And then, having done all they could, they sat down with their backs to the parapet and hoped for the best. 
It was not till half past eight that night that the German artillery condescended to notice them again, and then for about ten minutes they put a desultory fire of shrapnel on to the trenches. Then the range lengthened. Now Gerald was no fool, and suddenly the words of the sapper captain in the morning ran through his brain. They may make a small local advance under cover of dark. It was almost dark. They had shelled the trenches, apparently aimlessly, and now were shooting behind on the support trenches. Why? He groveled in the bottom of the trench and found a very pistol and flare. Up it shot into the air, and as it did, he saw them. The whole line saw them, and the fun started. The mad minute started in earnest all along the trench. The trench that enfiladed the ground in front of him got going with a maxim. Flares flew up into the air from all along the line, falling behind the advancing Germans. For about ten minutes the most glorious pandemonium reigned. Everyone was mixed up endways. In places the English had come out of their trenches and were going for them grunting and snarling in the open with bayonets. In places they were fighting in our trenches, in places we were in theirs. The maxim had ceased for fear of hitting its own men, and without intermission flares went up from both sides. Suddenly, on top of Gerald as he stood blazing away into the dusk, there loomed a Bavarian officer. It was touch and go, and if a sergeant beside him had shot a second later, this yarn might have had to close here. As it was, the bullet from the Bavarian officer's revolver found a home in the earth, and the Bavarian himself fell with a crash to the bottom of the trench. But it could not go on. In places they were breaking. In places they were broken. But unfortunately, in one place they had got through. At the extreme left of Gerald's trench, which he had been unable to reach during the day owing to a huge hole blown out of the parapet, the Germans had scrambled in. Elsewhere they had fallen back to their own lines, pursued the whole way by men stabbing and hacking at them, their eyes red with the lust of killing, getting a bit of their own back after the unspeakable hell of the morning. And what but a quarter of an hour previously had been bare open ground was now covered with motionless bodies, from which later a few wounded would drag themselves back to their own people. It was when comparative quiet again reigned that one of his sergeants came to Gerald and reported the uninvited appearance of the Germans away down on the left. Now the presence of the enemy in your own trench in small parties is, I understand, a thing that has frequently puzzled those who read about it at home. It is, however, a thing of fairly common occurrence and a small, hostile party on the offensive may prove extremely unpleasant. The whole thing becomes a question of bombs and rapidity of action. Also, I will willingly lay two to one on the side that gets off the mark first. A traverse, as everyone knows, is a great lump of the original soil left standing when the trench is dug, and round which the trench is cut. Its object is to localize the bursts of high explosive shell. As you cannot see round a corner or through solid earth, it is, therefore, obvious that you cannot see from one bit of fire trench into the next, though you can get there by walking round the traverse. If, however, there is a man sitting waiting for you with a rifle, this process is not to be recommended as he will certainly get in the first shot at a range of about five yards. Now all that Gerald knew, and, to his credit be it said, he acted with promptitude and without hesitation, and the man who does that in war, as in other things, generally acts with success. Bombs! he cried to the sergeant who had told him. Bombs of all sorts, plum and apple, hairbrush, 
any damn thing you can get, and all the men at once. They scrabbled them out of the debris and searched for them in the mud where they had been buried, and at last the party was ready, ten in all. What's the jest? said the sapper officer, dropping into the trench as they were being mustered. Bosch is lower down. We're bombing them out, answered Gerald. Then, for heaven's sake, see the fuse isn't too long, he replied. Just over an inch is enough for traverse work, or they'll bung em back. An inch of the fuse used will burn about a second and a half. With that, the party was off, led by Gerald. And they crept on till suddenly the sergeant gripped his arm and muttered, They're behind the next traverse. And from behind the earth in front came a guttural exclamation in German. Gerald, gripping a rifle, was quivering with excitement. He stole forward to where the trench bent back behind the traverse, while the two front men came up each with a bomb in his hand to throw, when lighted, over the top. It was at the precise moment that Gerald gave them the signal to light that he met his first German face to face. For, finding all was silent, the enemy had decided to make a little tour of inspection on his own. And just as the two bombs were lit and propelled over the traverse, a stout and perspiring Bavarian bumped his head almost onto Gerald's rifle. For a moment Gerald was as surprised as the crouching German, but only for a moment. For the Bavarian's death grunt, the crack of the rifle, and the roar of the two bombs were almost simultaneous. On em, boys, he shouted, jerking out his empty cartridge, and they scrambled round over the body into the next bit of trench. Four Germans lay stiff, and two were struggling to get round the next traverse. One did, and one did not. The sergeant got him first. Up to the next traverse, and the same process over again. But move, move, for heaven's sake, move! is the motto if you want to keep him on the run. And if a German wounded tries to trip you, well, halt, everyone, and send for the doctor and a motor ambulance for the poor chap. I don't think. For three traverses they went on, and then a voice came from the other side. We surrender! Oh, Gerald, Gerald! Would that one who knew the sweeps had been there with you. After all that's been written, why, oh, why did you not tell them to come to you instead of going to them? Surely you have read of their callous swinishness, and your sergeant's life was in your keeping. There were three of them when he rounded the traverse, and three shots rang out at the same moment. One hit his sergeant in the head, and one hit his sergeant in the heart, and one passed between his own left arm and his body, cutting his coat. It was then he saw red, and so did the men who streamed after him. Let's stick him, sir, said the men, though the Germans had now thrown down their rifles. Nothing of the sort, he snarled. Which of you said, we surrender? And with the veins in his forehead standing out, he glared at the Germans. I did, answered one of them, smiling. We really thought you would not be such fools as to be taken in. Extraordinary, wasn't it? laughed Gerald. Yes, the ass period had quite passed. His laugh caused the smiling German to stop smiling. As you avoided our bombs entirely owing to an unwarrantable mistake on my part, which cost me the life, he swallowed once or twice and his hands clenched, the life of a valued man, I can only remedy this loss on your part to the best of my ability. Ah, well, answered the German, we shall no doubt meet after the war and laugh over the episode. 
All is fair in love and, he shrugged his shoulders, and now we are your prisoners. Quite so, drawled Gerald. All ready for a first-class ticket to Donnington Hall. You shall now have it. Bring, my lads, three hairbrush grenades and put in four inches of fuse. That's about eight seconds, my dear friends. And he smiled on the Germans, who were now groveling on their knees. Gott in Himmel! screamed the one who had spoken. You would murder us after we have surrendered? Gerald pointed to the dead sergeant lying huddled in the corner. You had surrendered before you murdered him, he remarked quietly. Chapter 6 And now I come to the last day that our friend was privileged to spend in the lotus land of Ypres. When he returns, let us hope we shall have moved on. The place is a good deal too lotusy for most of us if the heavily scented air is any criterion. He had had most of the excitements which those who come over to this entertainment can expect to get, and on this last day he got the bonne bouche, the cream of the side shows. His battalion had come to the reserve trenches, as I have said, and from there they had gone to an abode of cellars, where the men could wash and rest, for nothing save a direct hit with a 17-inch shell could damage them. It was at three o'clock in the morning that Gerald was violently roused from his slumbers by his captain. Get to the men at once, he ordered. Respirators to be put on. They're making the hell of a gas attack. It seems to have missed these cellars, but one never knows. Then go and see what's happening. Upstairs, a confused babble of sound was going on, and upstairs Gerald sprinted after he had seen his men. A strange smell hung about in the summer air, the peculiar stench of chlorine. Luckily only mild, made him cough and his eyes smart and finally shut. The water poured out of them as eddies of wind made the gas stronger and for a time he stood there utterly helpless. All around him men grunted and coughed and lurched about helpless as he was, deprived of sight for the time. He heard odd fragments of conversation. The front line has broken, gassed out. They're through in thousands. We're done for. Let's go. And then clear above the shelling, which had now started furiously, he heard a voice which he recognized as belonging to one of the staff officers of his brigade. The first man who does go, I shoot. Sit down. Keep your pads on and wait for orders. Down the road came a few stragglers, men who had broken from the front line and from the reserve trenches. One or two were slightly gassed, one or two were wounded, several were neither. And what are you doing? asked the same officer, planting himself in the middle of the road. Wounded men in there. The remainder join that party and wait for orders. But they're through us, muttered a man, pushing past the officer. I'm off. Did you hear my order? said the officer, sternly catching his arm. Get in there, or I'll shoot you. Let me go curse you howled the man, shaking off his hand and lurching on, while the others paused in hesitation. There was a sharp crack, and with a grunt the man subsided in the road twitching. The staff officer turned round, and with his revolver still in his hand, pointed to the party sitting down by Gerald. Without a word, the men went there. I am going up to see what's happening he told Gerald. Get these men below in the cellars and keep them there. It's the shelling will do the damage now. The gas is over. Was it a bad attack? asked Gerald. One of the worst we've had. One part of the line has been pierced, but the men have stuck it well everywhere else. Mercifully, we've almost avoided it here. And with that he was gone. 
Two hours later, the wounded started to come down the road, and with them men who had really been gassed badly, probably through having mislaid their pads and not being able to find them in time. Some were on stretchers and some were walking. Some ran a few steps and then collapsed, panting and gasping on the road. Some lurched into the ditch and lay there vomiting, and on them all impartially there rained down a hail of shrapnel. In the dressing station they arranged them in rows. And that day two sweating doctors handled over seven hundred cases. For the gassed men, wheezing, gasping, fighting for breath, with their faces green and their foreheads dripping, they could do next to nothing. In ambulances they got them away as fast as they could down the shell-swept road, and still they came pouring in without cessation. Gerald, watching the poor struggling crowd, swore softly under his breath. He hadn't seen gas in its effects before, and the first time you see it you generally feel like killing something German to ease the strain. And it was at this moment that a bursting shell scattered a bunch of staggering men and almost blew an officer coming down the road into his arms. The officer smiled at him feebly and then wiped some froth from his lips with the back of his hand. He stood there swaying, his breath coming and going like a horse that's touched in the wind after being galloped. Out of one sleeve the blood was pouring, and with his hand he'd made a great smear of blood across his mouth. His face was green, and the gas sweat was all over him. Good God, muttered Gerald. Sit down, my dear fellow. No, he answered. I must get on. He spoke slowly and with terrible difficulty, passing his tongue over his lips from time to time and staring fixedly at Gerald. Where is the general? I have been sent to give him a message. <gasps> with a dreadful tearing noise in his throat, he started to try to be sick. The paroxysm lasted about five minutes, and then he pulled himself together again. Give me the message. I'll take it, said Gerald quietly. Listen, said the officer, sitting down and heaving backwards and forwards. Listen, for I'm done in. They've broken through on our left. There aren't many of them, but our left has had to give. Another paroxysm came on, and the poor lad rolled in the gutter, twisting and squirming. The gas caught me in my dugout, he croaked, and I couldn't find my pad. Just like me, always lose everything. Gerald supported his head and again wiped the froth from his mouth. Our men, and the wheezing voice continued at intervals. Our men are gassed to blazes, but they're all up there. They've not fallen back, except on the left, where they were up in the air. Poor chaps, lying in heaps, being sick. Noise in trenches like bellows out of work. It's a swine's game, this gas. Again the tearing and gasping. Tell the gunners to fire. For God's sake, get them to fire. They're infantry all over the place, and we're getting about one shell of ours to twenty of theirs. Oh, God, this is awful, and he tore at his collar. I'll go and find the general at once, said Gerald. The officer nodded. Good, I'll stop here till I'm better, and then I suppose I must go back to the boys. Poor devils, and I'm away out of it. 
he croaked hideously. My men never budged, and now they're being shelled to bits, and they're helpless. Get reserves, man. Get reinforcements. For heaven's sake, hurry. No one seems to know what's happening, and it's been awful up there. And so Gerald left him sitting by the side of the road, his eyes staring fixedly at nothing, periodically wiping the froth from his lips with a hand that left a crimson smear wherever it touched. And there the stretcher-bearers found him ten minutes later. One of hundreds of similar cases reported so tersely as suffering from gas poisoning. And here, having staggered across our horizon, he passes out again. Whether he lived or died I know not, that man with the shattered arm and wet green face, who had brought back the message from the men whose left flank was surrounded. All I know is that a quarter of an hour later Gerald was giving the report to the general, a report which confirmed the opinion of the situation which the staff had already formed. Half an hour later Gerald's battalion was ordered to counterattack, and, if they could get as far, fill the gap. Exactly five minutes from the time when the battalion passed the reserve trenches and, in extended order, pressed forward, my hero took it. He took it in the leg, and he took it in the arm from a high-explosive shrapnel, and went down for the count. They didn't get back all the ground lost, but they did very nearly, though of this Gerald knew nothing. He was bad, distinctly bad. He remembers dimly the agony the ambulance gave his arm that night, and has hazy recollections of a dear woman in a hospital train. He had landed at Havre on a Tuesday. That day, fortnight, he left Boulogne in a hospital ship. Back up the ancestral home founded on something in tins he will go in due course. Back to those same beautiful things. Creations, was the word, who graced the ancestral drawing room some months ago. The situation is fraught with peril. As I have whispered, his income will be something over five figures one day, and the creations have taken up nursing. But somehow or other, his views on life have changed, and I think the creations may have their work cut out. End of Section 3 Recording by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa Section 4 of The Lieutenant and Others. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Lieutenant and Others by Sapper. The End of Wipers. A sketch written during the first week of May. A nice balmy day, a good motor car, and a first-class lunch in prospect. Such was my comparatively enviable state less than a month ago. True, the motor car springs had had six months' joy riding on the roads of Flanders, and the lunch was to be in Prees. But one can't have everything, and Wipers was quite a pleasant spot then. In the square, souvenir hunters wandered through the cloth hall, and the cathedral intent on strange remnants of metal for the curious at home. Tobacco shops did a roaring trade. Market day was on. Villainous fragments of fried fish changed hands for a consideration, and every one was happy and contented. In a delightful little shop I ultimately found my way. Twelve small tables, spread with spotless linen, and needless to say, 
full of officers satisfying the inner man presided over by two charming french girls seemed good enough for me and sure enough the luncheon was on a par with the girls which is saying some in the vernacular as i left with a consignment of the most excellent white wine for thirsty officers elsewhere two soldiers passed me say bill said one this er whippers is a bit of oral right they can leave me here as long as they likes and as i crossed the railway at the western end of the town one shell passed sullenly overhead the first i had heard that day the only discordant note the only sound of war that was a month ago a fortnight ago duty took me past the same little shop and through the square this time i did not linger there were no souvenir hunters there was no market day again i was in a motor car but this time i rushed through hoping for the best instead of one shell they came in their hundreds a drunken swaying noise through the air like a tramway car going homewards on its last journey down an empty road a crash and the roar of the explosion mixed with the ramble of falling masonry another house gone in the dead city huge holes clawed up in the path road and every corner dead and twisted horses children lying torn in the gutter women and men gaping in their death agony here and there a soldier legs arms fragments of what were once living breathing creatures and in nearly every house had one god in a little groups of civilians still moaning and muttering feebly they had crept into their homes frightened terrified to wait for the death that must come and without cessation came the shells in one corner a motor ambulance stood drunkenly on three wheels in the middle a wagon overturned with four dead horses still fast in the traces and underneath them stuck out two legs the legs of what had been the lead driver a city of the dead not a sign of visible life save only our car picking its way carefully through dead horses and masses of bricks fallen across the road yesterday's tobacco buyers stiff in the gutters yesterday's vendors of fish dying in some corner like rats in a trap yesterday's luncheon shop a huge hole in the wall with the rafters twisted and broken and the floor of the room above scattered over the twelve tables with the spotless linen and perhaps worst of all the terrible all-pervading stench which seemed to brood like a pall over everything at last we were clear of the square and getting into the open east of the town over the bridge and up a slight incline then clear above the noise of the car for one most unpleasant second we heard the last tram going home the next second a deafening roar and we were in the centre of the stifling black fumes of a present from krupps all would have been well but for a dead horse in the centre of the road which caused an abrupt stop we left the car till the fumes had cleared away and stumbled gasping into the air with the water pouring out of our eyes and the fumes catching our throats and it was then we saw yesterday's tommy who had regarded wipers as a bit of oral right staggering down the road came three men 
lurching from side to side bumping up against one another then falling apart ever and anon collapsing in the road or the gutter disappearing into shell holes tripping over debris over trees over dead things gasping and panting they came on with their legs not strong enough to hold them nearer they came and their faces were yellow green and their foreheads were thick with sweat though the evening was chilly they were half sobbing half moaning with their collars open and their clothes coated in mud and one of them had a great gash over his head just before they reached us he collapsed in the ditch for the last time he was leaning forward and heaving with the agony of getting his breath a froth was forming on his mouth and his face was green in god's name what is it we asked one of the other two as they staggered by he stared at us vacantly gasped out the one word gas and disappeared into the shambles of prees we had not seen it before we have since and the first horror of it is past but as there is a heaven above there is not a man who has seen its effects who would not give every worldly possession he has to be able slowly to dribble the contents of a cylinder of the foulest and most diabolical invention yet conceived into a trench full of the originators of a device which most savages would be ashamed to use we picked up the poor devil in the ditch and got him to a dressing station he died in fearful agony half an hour after so i subsequently heard that was a fortnight ago four nights ago there was a great light in the sky standing up out of the blaze what was left of the cathedral showed up like a blackened sentinel through the trees the yellow flames shone with a lurid glow and the crashing of falling houses completed the destruction started by german shells the sight was one which will never be forgotten by those who saw it the final gutting of a stricken town for three days and three nights it blazed and now all is over it is the best end for that historic city the scene of so much senseless carnage how many of its harmless inhabitants have perished with it will never be known will probably never be even guessed at but fire is a purifier and purification was necessary in ypres End of section four recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Section five of the Lieutenant and Others. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Kibbe. The Lieutenant and Others by Sapper The Black Sheep Friesenberg, April 30, 1915 No one could have called Herbert Jones brilliant. His best friend, if he possessed such a thing, would not have predicted a great future for him. Into the manner of his living during the first twenty years of his life, it would be well not to inquire too closely. Herbert Jones, more generally known to his intimates as Herb, was a dweller in dark places, one of the human flotsam who emerge like rats from their holes at night and spend in the nearest gin palace the few pence they have nefariously earned during the day. He was just a product of the gutter. From the gutter he came, and to the gutter he returned in the fullness of time. And this was the way of it. Personally, I never made the acquaintance of Herbert Jones. 
Such information as I possess of his disreputable history was told me one night at a dreary crossroads three or four miles east of Ypres, with the greenish flares lighting the sky all around us and the stench of dead horses in our nostrils. My informant was one of my drivers who had lived in the same street with him in London. What it was that had caused the temporary ebullition of decent feeling in such an unpromising subject I was unable to find out. It was something to do with a lady called Lizzie Green, too much gin, and a picture palace which displayed a film of the Royal Horse Artillery galloping into action. In view of the fact that ninety per cent of Herbert's income was derived from making himself a public pest at jobbing stables, he quite naturally posed as a horsey youth, and that fact, coupled with Lizzie, the gin, and the film, apparently produced this one ebullition of decent feeling of which I have spoken. He enlisted. The very next day he presented his unrepossessing personality at a recruiting office, and his slum knew him no more. The Royal Regiment swallowed him up, gave him a uniform, decent food, and prepared to make a man of him. It failed. Hopelessly, dismally. The revilings of officers, the cursings of sergeants, the blasphemy of bombardiers alike failed to produce the slightest effect. His conduct sheet rapidly assumed the appearance of a full-sized novel. But there he was, and there he remained, a driver in the field artillery and the black sheep of his battery. A year later found him at Havre. From there he drifted to ruin, reviled by everyone who had the misfortune to have anything to do with him. At last, like a bad penny, he turned up again at his old battery, to the horror of all concerned, who thought they had effectually got rid of him at the beginning of the war. But the ways of record officers are wonderful, passing the ways of women. So when the news was broken to the major, and he had recovered, he ordered him to be put with the ammunition limbers, whose job it is to take ammunition to the battery nightly when they are in action and then return for more. And the captain, whose job is largely ammunition supply, heard his history from the sergeant whose job is entirely ammunition supply, and the remarks would be unprintable. Two nights later, the battery was in action in the salient somewhere east of Ypres, and the reserves of ammunition were away back somewhere to the west, and Herbert Jones was with the reserves. In the official communique, it was known as a time of artillery activity in the neighborhood of Ypres. In the communique of the battery, it was known as a time of hell let loose but especially was it so known among the ammunition limbers who nightly passed from west to east with full limbers and returned from east to west with empty ones. For, as may be seen by anyone who takes the trouble to procure an ordnance map, all roads from the west converge on Ypres, and having passed through the neck of the bottle diverge again to the east, which fact is not unknown to the Germans. So the limbers do not linger on the journey, but at an interval of ten yards or so, they travel as fast as straining horseflesh and sweating drivers can make them. In many places a map is not necessary, even to a stranger. The road is clearly marked by what has been left at its side, the toll of previous journeys of limbers who went out six in number and returned only four. And, should the stranger be blind, another of his senses will lead him unfailingly along the right road, for these derelict limbers and their horses have been there some time. The Germans were searching the road leading to Ypres, from the crossroads where I sat, waiting for an infantry working party that had gone astray, on the first of the two occasions on which I saw Herb. That is to say, they were plastering a bit of the road with shells in the hope of bagging anything living on that bit. In the distance the rumble of wagons up the road was becoming louder every minute. All around us, for it was a salient, green flares lit up the sky, showing where the front trenches lay, and occasional rolls of musketry, swelling to a crescendo, and then dying fitfully away, came at intervals from different parts of the line. A few spent bullets pinged viciously overhead, and almost without cessation came the angry roar of high-explosive shrapnel bursting along the road or over the desolate plow on each side. Close to me, at the crossroads itself, stood the remnants of a village, perhaps ten houses in all. The flares shone through the ruined walls, the place stank of death. Save for the noise, it was a dead world, a no-man's land. In the little village, two motor ambulances balanced themselves like drunken derelicts. Dead horses lay stiff and distended across the road, and a few overturned wagons completed the scene of desolation. Then, suddenly, over a slight rise swung the ammunition limbers, grunting, cursing, bumping into shell holes and out again. I watched them pass and swing away right-handed. In the rear came six pairs of horses, spare, in case. 
and as the last one went by, a man beside me said, Hello, there's Herb. It was then I got his history. An hour later, I was back at that same place, having caught my wandering infantry party and placed them on a line with instructions to dig and continue digging till their arms dropped off. But when I got there, I found it had changed a little in appearance that dreary crossroads. Just opposite the bank where I had sat were two horses lying in the road, and the legs of a man stuck up from underneath them, and they had not been there an hour before. The horses' heads were turned toward Ypres, and it seemed to me that there was something familiar in the markings of one of them. With the help of my drivers, we pulled out the man. It was no good, but one never knows. And the same voice said, Why, it's Herb. Crashing back on the return journey, the limbers empty, Herb again bringing up the rear with the spares, one blinding flash, and... We laid him in the gutter. Did I not say that he came from the gutter? And to the gutter he returned in the fullness of time. End of section 5 Section 6 of The Lieutenant and Others This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Kibbe The Lieutenant and Others by Sapper James and the Landmine A Comparatively Truthful Account of an Unpleasing Episode the reasons in triplicate which I gave to the general as to why the landmines had exploded at the wrong time are neither here nor there. Officially he accepted them, but it was all very trying and entirely due to James. James is a great thorn in my side. He always has been. He is always doing unexpected things, thereby causing much alarm and despondency among everyone who has the doubtful pleasure of his acquaintance. The last time I saw him before the war was at the Pitchley Hunt Ball some eighteen months ago, and though I hesitate to give the incident which occurred there, in view of possible doubts being cast on my veracity, and also because of its apparently trifling nature, yet its connection with the sad failure of the landmines is too deep for me to disregard it. Know, then, that James had on a pair of new silk breeches, purchased at great cost from his already despondent tailor. His pink coat was lovely. James always was lovely before the war. In addition to all that, there was a lobster moose. I know it all sounds very difficult, but the fate of nations sometimes depends on far less than a lobster moose. I discovered the lobster moose, I alone. I rode off my supper partner, a woman of doubtful charm but undoubted appetite, and returned later to that moose. It was the tenth wonder of the world, a moose en preuve sans reproche. I still dream of it. When it was nearly gone, James appeared in the supper room, and in a fit of generosity which still brings a lump to my throat, I indicated the remnants of that moose to him. He came, he sat down, he arose hurriedly. I will draw a veil over the painful scene that followed. As I heard James pointing out to a beautiful bean who posed as the head waiter, a chair in the supper room was not the best place to put a bunch of grapes. Suspicion centered on the table waiter, a Teuton of repellent aspect whom James saw laughing. He had a scar over his right eye, and looked capable of anything. Personally, both his partner and I thought it rather funny, but then, as he quite justly observed, it was he who had sat on the chair in question. The last I saw of him was in the cloakroom vowing vengeance on Germans in general, and that waiter in particular. From that day, until one night about ten days ago, I did not see James. His appearance, as usual, was most unnecessary and quite uncalled for, and furnishes the true reason for the failure of the landmines, which, I regret to state, differs in one or two small details from the one rendered to the general in triplicate. Briefly, this was how the matter stood. In one portion of our line, we had a trench, which was the semi-detached type. Both its ends were in the air, and at times it was most unhealthy. Sometimes it was occupied by us, sometimes by the Germans. At times, it was occupied by both, at other times by neither. It was a trench that had an air of expectancy over it, like a lucky dip in a bazaar. You might wander round a traverse one morning and find a German officer hating in a corner. The next morning you might find a young calf or a landmine. You never knew. All this uncertainty, coupled with the fact that the right flank of this trench was fifty yards from the one on its right, and that its left rested on a cesspit, made the general decide on drastic measures. He had another one dug behind. 
and ordered that it should be filled in, and in view of the fact that it was only forty yards from the Germans, it all had to be done at night. Furthermore, he suggested that it would indeed be nice if I could place half a dozen landmines in the filled-in trench. Dissembling my pleasure at this horrible suggestion, I retired from his dugout, relapsing hurriedly into a Johnson hole as a sniper opened a rapid and unpleasantly accurate fire on me. As a result of my cogitations, I found myself at about ten that night, crawling up a hedge towards the trench in question, while behind me came a cursing subaltern and several grunting men armed with shovels. In the rear, a dozen stalwarts carried the landmines. Now, the idea of a landmine is very simple. You fill a box of some sort with gun cotton, arranging the lid in such a way that it does not quite shut. You then place the box on the ground with the lid just below the surface, and the arrangement is such that should some unwary person tread on the lid, it promptly does shut, thereby driving a nail into a detonator and sending off the mine. This causes a severe shock to the person who inadvertently treads on it, at the same time causing great excitement among those of his neighbors who remain alive. My idea was to crawl to the trench, fill it in, and arranging the mines in suitable positions, retire and await developments. My difficulty, though it may seem a strange one to some people, was to find the trench, and having found it, to get them in there without being seen. It is astonishing how easy it is to lose one's way when crawling about a large open field at night, and the bit of trench I was seeking for was not very long. The German flares, which are extremely good, infinitely better than, but I will be discreet though it is perfectly true, render the process of walking about close to their trenches a somewhat hazardous one. Should one of these flares fall on the ground so that you are between it and the Germans, the only way to escape detection is to lie perfectly motionless until it burns out all of which tends to make progress slow. It was while one of them was burning itself out, and I was endeavouring to set a safe course between two shell-holes and a dead German, that James appeared out of the blue from nowhere. He had six German helmets, a few bayonets, and a variety of other trophies, and was making a noise like a wagon full of saucepans on a cobbled road. "'Dear old boy!' he cried, dropping everything on the ground. "'It's the deuce of a time since I've seen you!' It is one of the few things for which I can honestly return thanks, I remarked somewhat shortly. Would you like a megaphone to tell them I'm coming up to work on that trench in front? What are you going to do? he demanded. Fill it in and mine it when I can find it. Splendid, he answered. I'm your man. These, and he kicked the trophies, which promptly gave forth a crashy noise. Oh, I'll come from it. I've just been there. I will guide you. Under normal circumstances, I would as soon have been guided by a young elephant. But as I say, James is difficult. Very difficult. I think there are one or two Germans in it, he whispered as we crawled on. I heard one talking and threw a bomb over the traverse, but as I'd forgotten to light it, it didn't go off. The next instant, he disappeared and the procession came to an abrupt halt. A wallowing noise was heard, and James's head came into view again. This is the trench, he remarked tersely. The cesspit end. It was one of the few occasions that night that I laughed. My subaltern extended the men while I entreated James to go. I thanked him for his valuable assistance and earnestly begged him to depart. He could help me no more, and I knew there would be a calamity if he remained. It was all in vain. James was out for a night of it. So ultimately I left him to his own devices and departed to see what was happening. I found everything quite peaceful. Six landmines were lying at the bottom of a bit of trench, where we could get them when wanted, and the trench, all except about thirty yards, was being filled in. The thirty yards would be filled in later and would be mined. One could hear the Germans talking in their trenches, and for the moment an air of complete calm brooded over the scene. No sniper sniped, no gunner gunned. A few gaunt trees creaked slightly in the breeze, and an occasional rifle crack came sharply through the night from farther down the line. Then James fell into the trench again. This time he missed the cesspit and hit a German. As I have said before, it was all most annoying. A worrying noise was heard, and everyone fell flat on his face as a rapid fusillade broke out from all directions. Flares went up by the score, and everything became unpleasantly lively. The only person who seemed quite oblivious of all the turmoil was James. He suddenly loomed up in front of me, dragging a diminutive Bosch behind him. Do you remember? His voice was quite shaken with rage. 
the accursed swine dog of a waiter at the Pitchley Hunt Ball, who laughed when I sat on the grapes? I have him here. Lie still, you fool, I muttered. Do you want to get everyone scuppered? Of course, James paid not the slightest attention. I have him here, he grunted. I know that scar, you horrible reptile, and he shook the little brute till his teeth rattled. Are you aware that you spoilt the best pair of silk breeches I ever had, and I haven't paid for them yet? And with that, he threw him into the trench close by. Like James at the ball, he sat down and arose hurriedly. James would select the bit of trench where the landmines were. There was a most deafening roar, as all six went off, and that waiter will undoubtedly wait no more. James himself, I'm glad to say, was stunned, which kept him quiet for a time, but he was about the only quiet thing in France for the next hour. It is my personal belief that in addition to all the batteries on each side which opened fire simultaneously, the mysterious gun which has bombarded Dunkirk let drive as well. For two hours I lay in a wet trench, with a pick in the small of my back and James on top of me. About three we all went home, rather the worse for wear. James said he had a headache and wouldn't play any more. I got one giving my reasons to the general and triplicate. End of section six. Section seven of The Lieutenant and Others. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Kibbe. The Lieutenant and Others by Sapper. The Sixth Drunk to a very gallant Irishman who died in November 1914. Number 10,379, Private Michael O. Flanagan, you are charged, first, with being absent from roll call on the 21st instant until 3.30 a.m. on the 22nd, a period of five hours and thirty minutes, second, being drunk, third, assaulting an NCO in the execution of his duty. The colonel leant back in his chair, in the orderly room, and gazed through his eyeglass at the huge bullet-headed Irishman standing on the other side of the table. The evidence was uninteresting, as such evidence usually is, the only humorous relief being afforded by the sergeant of the guard on the night of the 21st, who came in with an eye of cerulean hue, which all the efforts of his painstaking wife with raw beefsteak had been unable to subdue. It appeared from his evidence that he and Private O'Flanagan had had a slight difference of opinion, and that the accused had struck him in the face with his fist. "'What have you got to say, Private O'Flanagan?' "'Short was one of the boys from Waterford, sir, I met in the town yonder, and we put away a bit of the stuff. I would not be denying I was late, but I was not drunk at all. And as for the sergeant, sure twas messing me about he was, and plaguing me, and I did but push him in the face. Would I be hitting him and he be a little one?' The colonel glanced at the conduct sheet in his hand. Then he looked up at O'Flanagan. "'Private O'Flanagan,' This is your fifth drunk. In addition to that, you have struck a non-commissioned officer in the execution of his duty, one of the most serious crimes a soldier can commit. I'm sick of you. You do nothing but give trouble. The next drunk you have, I shall endeavor to get you discharged as incorrigible and worthless. As it is, I shall send you up for court-martial. Perhaps they will save me the trouble. March out. Prisoner and escort, right turn, quick march. The sergeant major piloted them through the door. The incident closed. Now, all that happened eighteen months ago. The rest is concerning the sixth drunk of Michael O'Flanagan and what he did. And it will also explain why at the present moment, in a certain depot mess in England, there lies in the center of the dinner table, every guest night, a strange, jagged-looking piece of brown earthenware. It was brought home one day in December by an officer on leave, and it was handed over by him to the officer commanding the depot. And once a week, officers belonging to the 13th and 14th and other battalions gaze upon the strange relic and drink a toast to the 6th drunk. It seems that during November last, the battalion was in the trenches round Ypres. Now, as all the world knows, at that time the trenches were scratchy, the weather was vile, and the Germans delivered infantry attacks without cessation. In fact, it was a most unpleasing and unsavory period. In one of these scratchy trenches reposed the large bulk of Michael O'Flanagan. He did not like it at all, the permanent defensive which he and everyone else were forced into. It did not suit his character. 
Along with O'Flanagan, there were a sergeant and three other men, and at certain periods of the day and night the huge Irishman would treat the world to an impromptu concert. He had a great, deep, bass voice, and when the mood was on him, he would bellow out strange, seditious songs, songs of the wilds of Ireland, and mingle with them taunts and jeers at the Germans opposite. Now these bursts of songs were erratic, but there was one period which never varied. The arrival of the rum issue was invariably heralded by the most seditious song in O'Flanagan's very seditious repertory. One evening it came about that the Huns, tactlessly, decided to deliver an attack just about the same time as the rum was usually issued. For some time O'Flanagan had been thirstily eyeing the traverse in his trench round which it would come, when suddenly the burst of firing all along the line proclaimed an attack. Moreover, it was an attack in earnest. The Huns reached the trenches and got into them, and, though they were twice driven out, bit by bit the battalion retired. O'Flanagan's trench being at the end, and more or less unconnected with the others, the Germans passed it by. Though, as the sergeant in charge very rightly realized, it could only be a question of a very few minutes before it would be untenable. "'Get out,' he ordered, "'and join up with the regiment in the trenches behind.' "'And what are the issue of rum?' demanded Michael O'Flanagan, whose rifle was too hot to hold. "'You may think yourself lucky, my bucko, if you ever get another,' said the sergeant. "'Get out.' O'Flanagan looked at him. "'If you're after thinking that I would be leaving the rum to them swine, you are mistaken, sergeant.' "'Are you going, O'Flanagan?' "'But, Dad, I'm not. Not if the king himself was asking me.' At that moment a Bosch rounded the traverse. With a howl of joy, O'Flanagan hit him with the butt of his rifle. From that moment he went mad. He hurled himself over the traverse and started. It was full of Germans, but this wild apparition finished them. Roaring like a bull and twisting his rifle round his head like a cane, the Irishman fell on them, and as they broke, he saw in the corner the well-beloved earthenware pot containing the rum. He seized the thing in his right hand and poured most of the liquid down his throat while the rest of it ran over his face and clothes. And then Michael O'Flanagan ran amuck. His great voice rose high above the roar of the rifles, as, with the empty rum jar in one hand and his clubbed rifle in the other, he went down the trench. What he must have looked like with the red liquid pouring down his face, his hands covered with it, his clothes dripping with it, and that eerie half-light heaven knows. He was shouting an old song of the Fenian days, and it is possible they thought he was the devil. He was no bad substitute, anyway. And then of a sudden his regiment ceased to shoot from the trenches behind, and a voice cried, Oh, Flanagan! It passed down the line, and as one man, they came back howling, Oh, Flanagan! They drove the Germans out like chaff, and fell back into the lost trenches, all save one little party, who paused at the sight in front of them. There stood O'Flanagan astride the colonel, who was mortally wounded. They heard, rather than saw, the blow that fetched home on the head of a Prussian officer, almost simultaneously with the crack of his revolver. They saw him go down with a crushed skull, while the big earthenware jar shivered to pieces. They saw O'Flanagan stagger a little, and then look around, still with the top of the rum jar in his hand. "'You are back,' he cried. "'It is well, but the rum is gone.' And then the colonel spoke. He was near death and wandering. The regiment has never yet lost a trench. Has it, O'Flanagan, you scoundrel? And he peered at him. It is not, sir, answered the Irishman. I thought, muttered the dying officer, there were Prussians in here a moment ago. They were, sir, but they were not liking it, so they went. Suddenly the colonel raised himself on his elbow. What's the matter with you, O'Flanagan? What's that red on your face? It's rum, you blackguard. You're drunk again. His voice was growing weaker. Sixth time. Discharged. Incorrigible and worthless. And with that he died. They looked at O'Flanagan and he was sagging at the knees. Tis not all the rum the red on me. Colonel, dear. He slowly collapsed and lay still. And that is the story of the strange table adornment of the depot mess, the depot of the regiment who have never yet lost a trench. End of section 7 Section 8 
of the Lieutenant and Others. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa. The Lieutenant and Others by Sapper. The Mine. Some are born Huns, and others have Huns thrust upon them. Last night we exploded a mine under a redoubt in the enemy's trenches, and successfully occupied the crater. A considerable number of Germans were killed. Thus the official communique. And yet the great powers that be have no idea that this small local success was entirely due to David Jones, some time minor in a coal field in South Wales. In fact, the betting is about a fiver to an acid drop, that they have no idea that he exists. Bar the police in his local village, who disliked him intensely, and his NCOs out here, who disliked him still more, very few people do know that he exists. Undersized, in every way an undesirable acquaintance, a silent and morose man, it is nevertheless an undoubted fact that had it not been for David Jones, the aforementioned crater would not have been occupied, and the considerable number of defunct Germans would now be alive. And this was the way of it. The presence of David in such an unhealthy locality as Flanders was entirely due to his regrettable lack of distinction between meum and tuum. Exactly what occurred is immaterial, but deciding that the evils he knew of in the shape of prison were probably worse than the evils he did not know of in the shape of the Hun, our friend managed to evade the two pressing attentions of the police, and in due course found himself across the water in one of the new formed tunneling companies. These companies are composed almost entirely of those who from their earliest infancy have been reared in the atmosphere of moles rather than in the atmosphere of men, and have as their work out here the great game of mining and countermining. Early in the proceedings, it became apparent to those whose duty and privilege it was to command David Jones that his affection for woolly bears, pip squeaks, crumps, marias, and others of the great genus obus was not of that type which passeth the love of women. It is even rumored that on one occasion, in a wood behind the line which was receiving attention from the Hun, and in which lay our hero's temporary abode, he made a voluntary confession of several real and a few imaginary misdeeds of his early youth, in the hope of being sent back to prison and safety. Which is all by the way. In the course of time, however, the tunneling company was called upon to justify its existence, to become again as moles and not men, to gasp and sweat in the bowels of the earth, and thus the wood where they had been knew them no more. In front of our line, poked out a little from the German lines, there lay a semicircular redoubt. It was strong, very strong, as many officers in many regiments of foot will confirm. The ground in front of it bore eloquent testimony to frequent unsuccessful attempts to dislodge the enemy. Gunners had gunned it preparatory to assaults. Gunners had gunned it all day and every day for many days, but so far in vain. Always were the infantry met with the same deadly cross-machine gun fire did they set foot over our parapet. Wherefore, having failed to subdue it from the air and over the ground, they set for the miners and told them to try from underneath. And thus it was that David Jones came again to his natural element. Now I venture to think that of that natural element 
Comparatively little is known by those who remain in the island over the water. The charge of cavalry, the thunder of guns, the grim infantry attack through the swirling mists of dawn. These can be visualized, can be imagined. Pictures by artists, quite a small percentage of which are more or less accurate, give to those who have never seen the dread drama of war a tolerably accurate impression of what happens. But of David Jones's natural element, of that work which goes on day and night, ceaselessly, burrowing under the ground nearer, ever nearer the goal, there are no pictures to draw. And so, before I come to tell of what my ruffian miner did under the earth, in the place where the infantry had charged so often in vain, and of the German engineer officer, who was discovered with part of his helmet forced into his brain and his head split asunder, I would digress for a space and try to the best of my ability to paint that setting in which the human moles live and move and have their being. I would take those who may care to follow me to the front line trenches, where at a certain place, a sap head perchance, or a Johnson hole just behind, or even in the trench itself, a deep shored up shaft has been sunk. From the front, nothing is visible, and, by suitable screening, the inquisitive ones who fly overhead are prevented from seeing anything to cheer them up and make them excited. At the bottom of the shaft, two men are sitting, shoveling a heap of loose earth into buckets. Each bucket, as it is filled, is hoisted up on a rope, working on a pulley only to be lowered again empty when the earth has been tipped into some convenient shell hole, screened from the sight of the gentleman opposite. If seen, the steady exodus of earth from a trench at one point is apt to give the Hun furiously to think, always an unwise proceeding. In front of the two men is a low black hole, from which at regular intervals there comes a man stripped to the waist, glistening with sweat, pushing a small trolley on leathered wheels. While the two men silently tip up the trolley and empty out the earth, he stands blinking for a moment at the patch of blue sky, only to disappear into the low black hole, his trolley empty. Everything is silent. There is no hurry. Perhaps the occasional zip of a bullet a lazy crump of a shell down the line, that is all. That and the low black hole, ominous, sinister, the entrance to the mine. And now, mind your head, let us follow the man with the empty trolley. From far ahead comes the muffled thud of a pick, and behind one the light of day is streaming through the opening of the gallery. Bent almost double, one creeps forward, guiding oneself by one's hands as they touch walls that feel dank and cold. Then a turning, and utter absolute darkness, until far ahead a faint light appears, the light at the front face of the mine. Another man pushing a full trolley squeezes past you, his body gleaming faintly white in the darkness, while steadily, without cessation, by the light of an electric lamp, the man on the front face goes on picking, picking, his body glistening as if it had been dipped in oil. When he is tired, another takes his place. There is no pause. Each yard as it is taken out is shored up with mine cases and sheeting, otherwise the whole thing may collapse on your head. As you go on, your hands against the sides, you will find possibly an opening on one side or the other. The opening of another gallery, a gallery with a tea-head at the end, all finished. No earth is being carted from here. There is for the time no one in it. It is a listening gallery. And with the listening gallery and all it stands for, we come to grips with the real drama of mining. Were it merely the mechanical removal of earth, the mechanical making of a tunnel from one place to another, 
it would perhaps be a safer occupation. But just as inspiring to write about as a new cure for corns. Moreover, it was from a listening gallery that David Jones, still all in good time. Mining, like most games, is one at which two can play, and it is not a matter of great surprise that neither side will allow the other one to play unmolested. Therefore, where there is mining, there also is countermining, and the two operations are not exactly the same. For while mining is essentially an offensive act designed to blow up a portion of the enemy's trenches and form a crater in which men may shelter, countermining is essentially a defensive act designed merely to wreck the advancing mine. Thus both sides may at the same time be running out a mine towards the opposite trenches, and also a countermine in another part of the line to meet the hostile mine. Moreover, in a mine the charge is large, to effect as much damage as possible. In a countermine, the charge is small, in order not to make too large a crater in which the enemy may unscrupulously take up his abode. All of which is essential for the proper understanding of David Jones, his act. At periods, therefore, during the twenty-four hours, all work in the mine is suspended. The muffled tapping of the pick ceases, and silence, as of the grave, reigns in the underground world. And during this period, in each of the listening galleries, skilled men stand with their ears glued to the earth, and some with instruments of which I may not speak, and listen. There under the earth, with their dead lying above them, in that no man's land between the trenches, with ears strained in the silence, a silence that can be felt, they listen for that dread noise, the muffled tap-tap of the enemy's miners countermining towards them. Sometimes the mine goes through without any countermine at all. More often not. Frequently, the countermine is exploded too soon, or the direction is wrong and no damage is done, but sometimes it is otherwise. Sometimes there will be a dull, rumbling explosion. A few mine cases will fly upwards from the center of the ground between the trenches, perhaps a boot or a head, but nothing more. And the miners will mine no more. The countermine has been successful. But the estimation of distance and direction under the ground by listening to the muffled tap of the other man is a tricky business and depends on many things. A fissure in the right direction and it will sound close too when in reality it is far away. An impervious strata across your front and it will sound afar off when in reality it is near. Which all goes to show that it is a game of chance. But I would ask the armchair critic, the man in the street, if he have a spark of imagination, to transport himself to a mine where there is yet ten yards to go. Whenever for a space the moles stop and the underworld silence settles like a pall, they hear the tap-tap of the other workers' ghostly fingers coming out to meet them. And then the tap-tap ceases. Have the others gone in the wrong direction? bearing away from them, or are they close to, three or four feet away, even now charging the head of their countermine with explosive? Shall they go on, for time is precious, and finish that ten yards, or shall they stop a while and see if they fire their countermine? Is it safe to do another two yards before they stop, or is it even now too late? Is that great tearing explosion coming at once? in the next second, or isn't it coming at all? And all the time, those glistening, sweating men carry on. Pick, pick, pick. It is for the officer in charge to decide, and until then... Now, I don't, for a moment, think that David Jones regarded the matter at all in that light. An overmastering relief at being in a place where whiz-bangs cease from troubling and pip-squeaks are at rest, 
drove out all lesser thoughts. When it happened, he was as nearly contented as he was capable of being. The mine was ready to fire. Its head was well under the centre of the German redoubt, and all the morning slabs of gun cotton had been carried up to the head. With loving care the electric leads had been taken up, the detonator fixed up, everything was ready. The earth to damp the charge, so laboriously carted out, had been brought back again, to prevent the force of the explosion blowing down the gallery instead of going upwards and to the casual observer it seemed that the gallery ended merely in a solid wall of earth into which vanished two harmless-looking black leads. Now, the mine was going to be fired at seven o'clock in the evening. One does not prepare with great trouble an elaborate affair of that sort and then loose it off at any old time. All the infantry were warned. The gunners were warned. Staff officers at discreet distances buzzed like blue bottles. As soon as it went off, the infantry were to rush the redoubt, the gunners were to shell behind to prevent the counterattack, and the staff were to have dinner, which was all very right and proper. The only one of these details which interested David was the hour at which the mine was to go off. Until that time, he had fully made up his mind that the tea head listening gallery where he was comfortably smoking on a pile of sandbags, was a very much more desirable place than the trench up above, where, at or about the hour of 5.30, the Hun was wont to hate with shells of great violence coming from a direction which almost enfiladed the trench. He recalled with distinct aversion the man next him the previous evening who had stopped a large piece of shell with his head. At the same time, he had no intention of remaining in the tea head when the mine went off. 6.30 struck him as a good and propitious moment to take his departure to the dangers of the upper air. David Jones was not a man to take any risk that could be avoided, and the mere fact that everyone had been ordered out of the mine had no bearing on the subject whatever. Like his personal courage, his sense of discipline was nil. And so, in the dark silence of the mine gallery, lying at ease on sandbags, with no horrible whistlings overhead, David Jones settled himself to rest and ruminate, and in the fullness of time he slept. Now, the mining operations had gone without a hitch. Apparently the Hun had no idea that his privacy was going to be invaded, and no sounds of countermining had been heard. Once, very faint in the distance, a tapping had been heard about three days after they had started. Since then, it had not been repeated, and the officer in charge was not to be blamed for thinking that he had the show to himself. Nevertheless, it is an undoubted fact that the thing which woke David Jones was a large piece of earth falling on his face, and a light shining through the face of the listening gallery. The next moment, he heard a muttered ejaculation in a language he did not know, and great masses of earth rained down on his face while the light was extinguished. His training as a miner enabled him to see in a moment what had happened. That part of his mind worked instinctively. A German gallery had opened into their listening gallery. Some strata of soil had rendered it almost soundless, and his sleep during the last two hours had prevented him hearing the approach through the final two feet. All that he grasped in a flash. But what was far more to the point, he realized that in about two seconds he would be face to face with a horrible hun, a prospect which turned him cold with horror. Had he been capable of getting up, had his legs been capable of overcoming his terror, there is but little doubt that he would have fled to the safety of the open air. After all, a problematic shell is better than an encounter with a large and brutal man underground. But before he could move, a head and shoulders followed by a body came through the opening and fell almost on top of him. A torch was cautiously flashed, 
and by its light the trembling David saw a large and brutal looking man peering round. Then the man moved forward. Evidently he had seen that he was in a gallery off the main one, and had failed to see our hero sheltering behind the sandbags. For a long while there was silence. David could hear the German's heavy breathing as he stood a few feet from him just where the main gallery crossed the entrance to the tea head He realized that he was afraid to flash his torch until he was quite certain there was no one about. But now David's mind was moving with feverish activity. So far he had escaped detection. But supposing more of these terrible beings came. Supposing this one came back and did not overlook him again. The thought nerved him to action. Cautiously, without a sound, he raised himself from behind the pile of sandbags and crept to the spot where the tea had left the short gallery that connected it to the main one, and there he stood in the inky darkness with the German a few feet in front of him. His plan was to make a dash for safety when the German started to explore the main gallery. It seemed an eternity. In reality, it was about half a minute, before the light was again flashed cautiously into the darkness. It cast round in a circle and then came to a halt. He heard the sharp intake of the German's breath and saw the light fixed on the two black leads. Then things moved quickly. The German laid down his pick and fumbled in his pocket for his wire cutters. Those leads told their story plain for all to read. Again, in a flash, the dangers of his position struck David. This accursed Hun would cut the leads and then return and run straight into him. He wouldn't bother to explore the gallery further. He would merely murder him and pass on. A horrible thought. With infinite caution, he reached for the pick. The German was muttering to himself and trying to detach his wire cutters from his belt. At last he had them free, and flashing his torch once again, stooped forward to cut the lead, and as he did so with a grunt, David Jones struck, struck at the center of the head outlined in the circle of the light. There was a dreadful half-choked cry and silence. Two minutes later, David Jones was in the trench, looking fearfully over his shoulder as if expecting pursuit. The idea of warning the officer in charge that a German gallery had struck through into theirs never even entered his head. It was a matter of complete indifference to him if another Hun came in and cut the wire, so long as he wasn't on hand to be cut too. So it was fortunate, perhaps, that David had overslept himself, as one minute after his arrival in the upper earth there was a deafening thunderous roar. A great mass of earth, roots, wood, and other fragments flew upward and then came raining down again. The infantry were across in a flash. The curtain of shrapnel descended, and the staff had dinner. There were two things that no one ever cleared up satisfactorily. One was the presence of a miner's pick, of a pattern different to that in use in the British Army, in the tool dump of a certain tunneling company but it was a very small thing and no one worried. The other was the presence of a German engineer officer in the mine shaft with his helmet or part of it in his brain. Various opinions were given by various people, but as they were all wrong, they don't matter. Anyway, the mine had been most successful, and everybody shook hands with everybody. All, that is, except David Jones who was undergoing field punishment number one for stealing the emergency rum ration and getting drunk on it. Which is really rather humorous when you come to think of it. End of section eight.